Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, as folks are streaming in, go ahead and introduce yourself where you are currently in the world and one thing that is bringing you joy today or this week. I don't know if you can see how fast that chat is going, but with 869 folks answering, it's pretty amazing. And even if you can't read what everyone else is saying, it is just good to know where is your joy this morning and where are you finding it? Um, and to sit in that as we begin our day today and as we begin the symposium. Okay, um, we will go ahead and begin. Um, it, wow, over 900 people are here right now and are still streaming in. So thank you all for showing up today. Um, I am just so grateful and excited that you are all here. Um, I'm gonna be reading from the screen a little bit because I, um, I have the gift of gab and if I don't, I'll just go on forever. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> there are a ton of amazing speakers here today that we definitely want to make sure that we get to. Um, so we will go ahead and begin. Um, I will also say that I get, I'll preface by saying that I get really excited. Um, and I don't know that I need to tell any of you all that I think you can tell from the videos that I've pre-recorded. Um, and so I say that to say that if I am speaking really quickly. Go ahead and let me know in the chat and I'll try my best to slow down um, because I wanna make sure that you all are hearing what I am saying today. Okay, um, so we will go ahead and begin. Is there, I can't tell if it's sharing the screen. Is the presentation up on your all, your end? Nope, okay. So, um, Zaki, you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. Okay, so on the screen is a quote from a book called Heavy by Kiese Lehman, and it says, the most abusive parts of our nation obsessively neglect yesterday while peddling impossibility. I remembered that we got here by refusing to honestly remember together. Um, and this is a book that is really one of the best books I've read 
in the last decade. Um, it's a vulnerable telling of the ways in which race and racism in the US complicates our ability to live, to learn, to love, to teach, to trust, to just simply try and what it means to still do so in a country that would rather pretend its racial violence doesn't exist. Um, I could describe it to all of you in a lot of ways, but that would take a really long time. So I'll just say that you should read the book, um, buy the book, check it out from the library. Um, if you don't have a library card, get one. That is my first plug for the library today. Um, uh, is it okay? You can go to the next slide now. So you want to start by acknowledging that we are occupying indigenous land. We acknowledge that 48 contemporary tri tribal nations are historically tied to lands that make up the state of Colorado. We acknowledge and honor the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute tribes, and all of the original indigenous peoples of the land upon which Denver Public Library stands. So to me, an acknowledgement is more than just a taking in of words. It is saying, I see you, I hear you, and I will do my best to do better by you. So a land acknowledgement to me isn't simply recognizing that this is stolen land, land taken from a people who were inhumanely treated, a people more expansive than the abuse they endured and endure still. The US does an excellent job of forgetting its history, but that, but that not remembering is an act of violence, is an act of harm. And so we acknowledge the fact that the history of the US as a country is birthed from their unjust suffering and we also acknowledge the resilience of indigenous people, their connection and their strength. We remember their painful histories in unjust present times and we promise to do better by them. For me, that means learning about the original inhabitants of the land I situate myself on, uplifting their stories of suffering and their stories of survival. It means remembering. I invite you all to do the same. If you haven't, learn about the land you occupy and people who first inhabited it make a commitment to remembering so that we don't perpetuate that harm. Presently, we are at a precarious point in history. Perhaps we've always been in one, but this one feels particularly piercing. This history, which includes everything that came before, which in the United States means the genocide of indigenous peoples and the enslavement of black peoples, this ugly history has bled into a strange present that includes the erasure of indigenous peoples in their history, the refusal to repatriate land, state-sanctioned violence against Black people, rampant Islamophobia, the caging of human beings at the border, a pandemic that is disproportionately plaguing Black and brown people because of, soci because of society's inequities, growing anti-Asian racism, and an administration that doesn't seem to care about any of it. If that is our past, and if this is our present, what kind of, what kind of future is possible for us? How did we get here? How did we get here to this point in time? And also, who do we come from? And you can go to the next. So I would like to take a moment to properly welcome you all into this space and orient myself in it. So good morning. My name is Oziyama Nkechi Oloziyam. I was given this name by two Nigerian immigrants, Igbos to be exact. And the Igbos are one of the, one of the oldest and largest tribes in Africa and are native to southeastern Nigeria, where my family and ancestral home still reside. Oziyama means good news, and Kechi means God's gift or gift from God, both names my parents proudly say are fitting for me to this day. So for us Igbos, our name bear a message, a meaning, a story, an observation, a history, a life experience, or a prayer. They embody a collective of my people's rich heritage and provide a window into our value systems and life philosophies. Igbos believe that God, man, and destiny are intertwined and that sacred trinity is woven into our names and shapes who we are in certain ways. In Igbo ontology, humans are relational, not static, and our identity is better defined and understood in relation to our families and our communities. We find meaning and identity and the idea and the reality of the other and without the others, we lose value, meaning community and connection are paramount to our indigenous culture. So on the screen is Patricia. Patricia, who survived famine and war, who didn't have more than a second grade education, but knew how to stretch rations provided by the World Health Organization to feed her children and ensure that three of her four children survived. 
who never had enough, but always had enough love, enough care, enough commitment to her family and community, who gave everything she had to make sure her children never went hungry. One of her children became a man who became my father. Igbos also believe that our ancestors are always present in our current generations. My father believes that I am her in certain ways. The reincarnation of his mother, Patricia Alosium, pictured here in Nigeria sometime in the 70s in what may very well be the last photograph she ever took with the last thing my father ever received from her, a rosary, which is to say a prayer. That's important for a lot of reasons, but it's largely important because that is why I am here today. I come from a long line of people who had to survive. And though I never met my grandmother, I think about her constantly. I think I start by naming this um, because it is why I stand before you as a critical black feminist and also why I do the work that I do. And in order for me to show up fully in front of you all, I wanted to first name my relation to this work and why it matters to me. I'd also like you to take a moment to do the same. You don't have to share it in the chat, just pause a beat to reflect. And while you're doing that, I am going to turn things over to Michelle Jeske, who is the director of Denver Public Library, who will welcome you all into this space and say some thank yous. I hate to interrupt your thinking on that. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our symposium. Um, as Ozzy said, I'm Michelle Jeske. I'm the city librarian or the director of the Denver Public Library. We are so glad you're joining us for the next few days to learn, to listen, and to grow together. We are really confident that after your participation in this symposium, that you will walk away with a variety of tools that you can implement at your own organization and a new support system that you can lean on along the way. This journey won't be easy, but it is necessary. We've existed in systems that aren't serving every person in our community for a very long time. In fact, they have predominantly oppressed people of color. Racist systems in this country have existed for hundreds of years and change hasn't been and won't be easy. It will take time, but it's up to all of us to begin to change these systems in order to ensure that everyone in our communities can thrive. Over the last six weeks or so, we have witnessed social unrest in every corner of our nation. To some, this social unrest has come as a surprise, a learning experience, and a heartbreak. To others, it's not shocking at all, and certainly not new. The exposure of racist experiences by people of color is bringing to light what has been happening all along. The fact is, that what we've seen over the last several weeks is a reflection of the complexities of race in this country that we've never really worked through. We are learning more and more about what our friends, our neighbors, and our colleagues of color have been experiencing for hundreds of years in different ways. Racism is something we can no longer ignore. It's rooted in every corner of our society, in our school systems, banks, neighborhoods, in the more obvious areas like police departments, jails, and the larger ju judicial system. It's rooted in our own organizations in different ways. And for the next three days, we will learn how we can help our organizations do what's right and work to create change. The equity journey for Denver Public Library has been evolving for some time. About three years ago, we began to be more intentional about our efforts to address equity. We developed a staff committee to explore what this could look like. Our executive team also began to educate ourselves more about racism, what white privilege and fragility mean, and how we can learn to be allies. We applied for and received an IMLS grant, which is helping us explore how to build a pipeline with an equity lens, allowing us to hire Ozzy, who you just met, to dream of, create, and host this week's symposium. We also went through a lengthy strategic planning process that helped us create a new vision, mission, and values. One of our five core values being equity and a vision of a strong community where everyone thrives. We've learned a lot and we have a long way to go, but we are very committed. Please know that you have a partner in the Denver Public Library and we look forward to learning from all of you as well. 
Thanks to the Institute for Museum and Library Services for the critical funding that has made this project, including this symposium, possible. We also want to thank Visible for supporting this symposium. You'll hear more about the grant project during Friday's What the Data Reveals session, but I want to thank DPL's EDI committee for laying the groundwork for the grant, as well as DPL staff, Annie Kemmerling, Christina McClelland, Nicanor Diaz, Virginia Vassar, Hong Ha, Taylor Shafter, and Bria Ward, as well as several community partners and other libraries nationwide for developing the original project. Thanks to Christina for serving as grant project director and our project steering committee who has contributed to this work and I'd like to recognize them now. Dr. Namrita Singh, Sonia Irvin, Valerie Garrett Turner, Dr. Sadie Winlock, Kelly Stade, Laura Tadina, Christina Fuller Gregory, Antonio Apodaco, and Brian Holsey. I also want to thank Zakia Ringgold, our virtual host and producer who is supporting all of you and our fabulous presenters this week. And I also want to thank Franklin for that inspirational start to our day. I know it got me grounded and ready for this week's work. And of course, thanks to the incredible Ozzy for planning and creating the impactful symposium you'll be attending over the next few days. And lastly, thank you all for being here. Over the next three days, I hope you will feel inspired, committed, committed, and ready to take action. We owe it to ourselves, our community, and our staff to keep pushing for equity across all our communities. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Michelle. Um, so I like to tell stories and so I'll try to keep them brief, um, but one time when I was teaching middle school math and helping a student struggle through a challenging problem, I offhandedly said something along the lines of practice makes perfect. And another student um, overheard me and said, no, 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 practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes progress. Um, and I was like, yeah, you're right. She was in the seventh grade, but it just, it, it goes to show that one, the youth have a lot of wisdom themselves, but if we take the time to listen, we ourselves can learn from them. Um, and so, I say that to say um, that I'm going to be honest. Um, this is my first virtual event that I've ever planned and managed, so it won't be perfect. Um, I'm sure that we'll have technology issues as we've <laughs> already had this morning, so thank you for bearing with us through that. Um, and I'm sure that this or that might happen. Um, but white supremacy culture has ingrained this idea in us that we have to get ex it exactly right the first time, which isn't realistic or productive. All we can do is our best. If it falls short, that's just where it lands. We assess what happened, we apologize if necessary, and we commit to trying again and learning from what occurred. One of the things that I will first apologize for is our inability to provide you all with closed captioning. Due to some technological issues, we will unfortunately not be able to, con not be able to provide it in real time. Um, and I really deeply apologize to those who that affects. Um, all sessions, though, except for the BIPOC and Solidarity one, will be recorded and closed captions will then be available at that time. And I will make sure that everyone gets that. They will be um, available on the symposium site after the symposium and on the Denver Public Library YouTube page as well. Um, I'm not striving for perfection here. None of us should be. What I'm striving for is deep intention and authenticity. I'm showing up as my full human self, which includes the parts of me that doesn't always get things right. So I'm willing and ready to make mistakes, to stumble through this thing together, to learn out loud with you all. This event was supposed to be a smaller in-person event that would have taken place in April. It was going to be capped at 125 people and only last one day. But things happened and so we had to adapt with them. And now here we are embarking on a three-day journey um, that over 3,500 people across the country registered for and that over a thousand people are present for her are present for currently. Um, so thank you all for showing up for that. Some quick logistical notes for the symposium. Um, so for any questions that we receive, we're going to be using a strategy called progressive stacking, which is a technique intended to give marginalized voices a chance to speak, particularly in an environment where there is a dominant group present which means that if you choose to self-identify as belonging to a marginalized racial or ethnic group, and you'd like to ask a question or make a comment in the chat, 
you can choose to include an asterisk at the start of your question um, and our community moderators who are compiling questions will prioritize those with the asterisk. Um, you aren't required to self-identify, of course, it's just an option and we'll do our best to get to all of the questions as they come. And lastly, before I hand it over to our brilliant virtual um, programmer, Zakia, who will be sharing a few more logistical things, I just want to remind you all to please avoid gendering folks if you're unsure of their pronouns. If you don't know what their gender is, it's just good practice to either use their name or to simply ask. Um, and now I will hand it over to Zakia. Thank you, Ozzy, for that amazing opening. I'm going to echo what everyone is saying in the chat. We all feel grounded. Um, my name is Zakia Ringgold. I will be your virtual producer trying to pull as many of the strings behind the scenes as possible. Very nice to meet you all. So what I want to do is make sure that you're all comfortable with how you will be interacting over the next three days. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to our actual page here within the platform. So let's get this over. Sorry, guys. So the first thing I'm going to show you and what you may have noticed now and how you're all able to join us is every single session is going to be listed right at the top of the screen. Are you all able to see my screen okay? Let me just make sure. I'm seeing, yes, yes, perfect, okay. So the nice thing about that is you don't need any kind of Zoom links or passcodes to get in. As long as you log into the platform, when our sessions go live, you wanna go ahead and click the button. And as you can see in what Ozzy told us a moment ago, over 3,500 people have registered, but we did want to make it available so even if you can't get into the live session because a thousand people have beat you to it we are streaming live to the denver public library youtube channel so if for whatever reason maybe you're a few minutes late or you've seen that cap reached head over to the youtube channel and you'll be able to see all of the sessions um, and now what i'm going to show you is the virtual networking space, which is a little bit different. Some of our sessions, you will have an opportunity to network with each other in our virtual networking space. And what this allows you to do, as you can see, there are multiple tables. And what that means is at each table, you can have up to six individuals. When those sessions are available, you can simply just double click on any open seat and as you can see, my picture is appearing right at the top of the page. So everyone who is sitting at a table with you, you will be able to interact with them with your video, with your audio, and really keep the conversation going, which is so very, very important. There's also going to be some presentations in here as well. If you have any questions whatsoever, I am available by you just clicking the link on the main page saying I need help or responding to any of the email messages that you have received. And so I am your virtual experience architect here. My company is Virtual Experience Design and I hope you all have a fantastic and an incredible symposium. Thank you Ozzy for the opportunity and I'm gonna turn it right back over to you. Okay, um, and while Zakia is pulling back up the slides, in the spirit of transparency, we're probably going to run uh, maybe like 10 minutes over, which is why I built a little window in between for between our next session. Um, so if you, you have places to go, if you need to take a bathroom break, I just want to let you know that. I do want to let you know that we will be closing out with an amazing, amazing poet that you will want to hear, um, and I do want to give him his full set time. So. We will be running a little bit over, but that is all right because we are being graceful in this space, right? Um, so here is another quote by <laughs> Kiese Lehman, who, like I said, this book blew my mind and I think about it constantly. And I read it maybe three years ago at this point. Um, and so the quote on the screen says, I wanted to ask you if we were deserving of different kinds of liberation, different modes of memory, different policy, different practices, and different relationships to honesty. 
Now, I hope you all read our code of conduct, which is really an invitation for you all, guidance so that we can be in right relationship in this space. The accountability that I believe in isn't a punitive thing, but an invitation. And I can only model what it means to be accountable to myself and the people I'm in community with and invite you all to do the same. We are all accountable to our actions and our words within this space. We're building community here. So in addition to the code of conduct on our symposium page, I'd like to set some norms so that all of us know what the expectations are not only for how we are treating other people, but how we want to be treated. So these are borrowed from Mackenzie Mack, who is a gender expansive anti-oppression consultant and founder of Boundary Work. Um, and they graciously agreed to let me share these agreements with you all because I felt them applicable and relevant to our space. We, number one, we agree to struggle against racism, sizeism, transphobia, classism, sexism, ableism, and the ways in which we internalize myths and misinformation about our own identities and the identities of other people. We know that no space can be completely safe and we can be completely safe and we agree to work together towards harm reduction, centering those most affected by injustice in the room, even if that means centering ourselves. We know that we can't agree to safety, but we can agree to harm reduction. We agree to sit with the discomfort that comes with having conversations about race, gender, identity, the nonprofit industrial co complex, etc. We agree to try our best not to shame ourselves for the vulnerability that these kinds of conversations require. We are yet, number four, we are to value the viewpoints of other people that do not challenge or conflict with our right to exist. And that includes the rights of other people to exist. And number five, we agree it's okay to have feelings. It's okay to feel uncomfortable when we're discussing complex topics about accountability, equity, relationships, justice, and care. So now I'm going to give you all a moment to read through these on your own. Um, if, you embrace these if you embrace these agreements, please indicate so in the poll. Um, so there's a poll here and you can scroll through them and you can vote on the ones you embrace and you can vote on the ones you don't embrace. And I want you to have consent in your determination on what you do and do not agree with. So I'll give you about 30 seconds or so to do so. It seems like a lot of you are embracing this and agreeing to these commitments. And so I'm grateful for that. Um, so we are accountable for our actions and words, but we are also need to be accountable for our healing, especially when it comes to engaging in equity work. Um, we're all being socialized by white supremacy, so we all have to heal from it. Um, Mackenzie Mack, they did an excellent job of stressing that in a recent presentation that I watched um, on their YouTube. We also have to find ways to fortify our spirits so that we're able to sustain against the, to sustain the fight against it, um, against racism, against white supremacy, against all of the isms, which means that we have to be able to do the work needed to show up as present as we can in the work that we do, which is why we started with self-care and why we will be ending each day with it. Um, so our goal here is to really explore an embodied approach to racial equity work. While we understand that equity issues cut across race, gender, class, size, ability, sexuality, and other social identities, we are explicitly focusing on race because of the times that we are in. Our goal is to create space for new ways of enhancing racial equity within the workplace to emerge. This is an invitation for everyone to participate in the exchange of knowledge and the co-creation of new ideas around equity and justice. You are encouraged to bring your whole selves into the conversations that will take place over the next three days not just your professional or academic self, but your personal selves, your cultural selves, your human feeling, sensing selves. And so speaking of feeling selves, I am thrilled to now introduce my dear friend, Bobby Lefebri. Bobby Lefebri is an award-winning writer, performer, and cultural worker, fusing non-traditional multi-hyphenated professional identity to imagine new realities, empower communities, advance arts and culture, and serve as an agent of provocation, excuse me, <laughs> transformation, equity, and social change. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Huffington Post, The Guardian, American Theater Magazine, NPR, and Poets.org. In 2019, Bobby Lefebri was named Colorado's eighth poet laureate, making him the youngest and first person of color to be appointed to this position in its 100-year history. 
Bobby Lefebvre holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from the Metropolitan University of Denver and a master's degree in arts and culture from the University of Denver. So I will now turn it over to him and he is going to bless us. And I really mean bless us. Um, and some amazing, amazing poetry. So I am very excited. I want you all to really lean back and embrace what he is going to share. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers of this much needed symposium for inviting me to be here with you all this morning. I'm always uh, super grateful when art and poetry is included as an avenue to address and tackle uh, this necessary work. Um, it's important to have artists and dreamers and philosophers and imaginers at the forefront of conversations about, you know, what we want our collective future to look like. And, you know, currently we're in the middle of unprecedented times, as been stated before, right? Uh, and as a poet, and especially as, as Poet Laureate, um, I feel a responsibility to utilize language as a tool for social dialogue and a weapon for social change. Uh, our nation is, is watching as uh, a global pandemic and the fight for civil rights are converging in, in monumental ways. The uh, nation is watching as the diseases of racism, whiteness, white supremacy are being put on trial like never before, and we're having to make a choice about what side of history that we are going to ride with, right? Um, there's some uncomfortable truths in that, uh, that we are all sort of having to reckon with. Um, we're seeing that reckoning and a fallout with a nation that has refused to come to terms with its past. And, and outside the comfort of these virtual walls, uh, as weird as it may be, right, there is a, a beautiful but broken and bleeding world that needs our hands and hearts more than ever. At this moment in our nation's history, at this moment in our world's history, it's no time to be indifferent. It's no time to be a passive bystander. It's no time to not act. Uh, until about a month or so ago as a nation, you know, we were riddled with collective complacency. We lived in a world where alternative facts and demagoguery seemed to overshadow truth and love. Um, are we on the verge of something new? I, I believe so, right? But it depends on how we react to right now. Uh, we're in a fight for our lives, right? For our communities, for equality, for our health, for our humanity. We're, we're in a fight for all of those sugar-cutted uh, ideals that our nation avows, but religiously fall short of, of manifesting. And so for those of us who have been doing this work, liberation work for a long, long time, this new wave of woke energy can actually feel exhausting, right? So um, many of us uh, are scratching our heads saying we've been saying these things, right? We've been pushing anti-racist models. We've been talking decolonization. So thank you to the organizers of the symposium for centering those who have been in the work for a while as we welcome those who are new or have been magnificently uh, you know, transformed. Uh, I'm going to share some poems, uh, and I want to begin with a poem that's sort of um, an invocation, right? I think so much of cultural work and poetry and artist work is, is ritual. So this is a, an exercise in ritual. We gather here together in this sacred circle like we always have. Here around this fire that has always burned. The same fire that lives in our bellies and makes an inferno of our hearts. This spirit we summon, this beauty we conjure, this inventiveness we invoke. What is a vessel but a carrier of the coveted, a transmitter of quintessence, a conduit of culture? Come and meet us at a place where ritual is given a body, where ceremony is given a face, where our existence transfigures into a song we warble in unison. For he who sharpens his imagination is a visionary. She who gives shape to intuition is a prophet. They who hold mortality beseech the immortal. Look at what we are building together. We, the masons of reimagining, the architects of metamorphosis, the repositories of our collective consciousness. Blessed be the makers, the ones who set themselves ablaze willingly to warm the masses, the ones who traverse the unknown, giving life to the unseen. Join us as we turn ourselves inside out. Watch as we illuminate what kindles inside our bones, these places where we find and lose ourselves at the same time. 
These messages we devise with purpose, these aesthetics we mold from the supple clay of our minds, join us at these holy places of abandon, these playgrounds of ingeniousness, these geneses of more inspired tomorrows. For who does not admire a flower unfolding? Who does not feel the warmth of the sun shining boldly upon their face? Whose feet do not move with the coaxing of the drum sound? Come and meet us at a new juncture where expression devoid of consciousness is merely decoration, where art is an insistent incubator for justice, where equity and access are an altar we decorate with the flowers of promise and purpose. For what is it to highlight the margins but to attempt to balance the scales? What is a raised fist but a war cry in the language of the purposely silenced? What is dissent but innate aversion to the confines of the status quo? Art and culture is a communal land that does not know borders. A common language we are all born speaking fluently. A right that has been paraded around is a privilege for far too long. Come and help us rip the esoteric from the sky. Let our hands reach for the stars, grasp them, and share their tangible glow with anyone drawn to their light and here. We will all shine and wander together. Here, we will eradicate all of the man-made barriers we impose upon one another. This beautiful burden we carry, this responsibility tethered to our pens, paint, pirouettes, percussion, and performance, this work, this digging, these hands unearthing the truth, this joy, this beauty, this struggle, these songs, these testaments, these heirlooms, these markers of humanity that remind us that we are here, that we are alive, that we always have been and that we always will be. Yeah, so, you know, I, like you, have been thinking a lot about, about justice and freedom and, and liberation lately. You know, justice, you know, what it means, who it's for, how it shows up in society, in love, in literature, in our hearts. How do we get there? Is it a destination? Is it a process, an imaginary place? I'm not quite sure. But there are sweet bells of justice ringing righteously in the distance. From where we stand, the sound is faint but unmistakably beautiful. From where we stand, faith convinces us to listen to what we hunger to one day see. These recondite sounds, majestic as the Quetzal's coup, these recondite sounds, soothing as the lullaby the sunset sings as it slow dances across the horizon and we, we run with hope and abandon in the direction of the chimes. Traverse an American landscape that has made winners of some and bullseyes of others. Traverse an American landscape that has been stolen, enslaved, and interred with bones and blood. Even still, we run feverishly toward the bells because on good days, we know the ideals that live where the music is promise equality, Promise prosperity, promise liberty and justice for all. Our hearts are compasses that point in the direction of freedom. Our hands, shovels, unafraid to dig into the dirt. Our voices, keys we use to open doors not meant for us to walk through. Our minds, luscious playgrounds where dreams and better tomorrows marry in the chapel of perseverance. For in the distance, maybe just outside our reach, balanced scales beseech to be seen. In the distance, the sword Lady Justice wields in her right hand is not slashing disproportionately in the distance. Her blindfold has not yet slipped from her eyes. Beneficent is the red road that we have traveled, dignified the path we have carved with promise. We are the fruit our ancestral roots dreamed into existence, flowers cultivated in the garden of hard work and sweat. Over a lifetime, the human heart beats more than two billion times without stopping. This means that we have two billion reasons to stretch our wings, to fly in the face of adversity, to dance amid the smoke, to love through all the hate. May boundaries be nothing more than invitations for exploration, a starting line from which we sprint in the direction of the uncharted, a catapult that launches us in the direction of the fruition of our dreams. May justice prevail. May it be not a fleeting illusion only pursued, but a beacon of virtue we attain tirelessly and justly together for in the distance the bells are still ringing promise is calling and we will not stop running until we arrive until we all are free it seems so simple right that idea of, of freedom and, and justice and liberation um, but those of us who have been working for for generations and for lifetimes we know that it's not that simple 
Um, this next poem begins with a quote from Langston Hughes. Uh, I dedicate this poem to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Jesse Hernandez and Frank Lovato and Trayvon Martin and, 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 and. Negroes, sweet and docile, meek, humble and kind, beware the day they change their mind. Wind in the cotton fields, gentle breeze, Beware the hour it uproots trees, Langston Hughes. We, the black and brown boys and girls, the black and brown men and women, the ones whose history is embedded in their skin, he who has warrior carved into his heart, she who carries civilizations inside her cosmos, there are all these bodies, these kingdoms of bone and flesh, these places our children call home. Sacred soil where bullets are forcefully interred. Memorials sprouting where rooted flowers should be. And we, the living, cast our voices like nets into the shadows. Rain falling upon our grieving faces, masking our tears. We howl in unison like wolves at the moon. Fangs showing beneath our trembling lips. Our hearts dance like pop bottle rockets inside of us. The knots tying our stomachs unable to be unraveled. Still somehow, we find a way to lick each other's wounds. We pray because it's more constructive than setting fires. Hands clasped, keep them from bawling into fists. We sing because we're tired of shouting curses. We build because we're tired of being destroyed. We march because we're tired of being walked on. We evolve into new things because we are tired of trying to convince them that we are human one day soon. We will stop praying. Our songs will coalesce into war cries, our bullets will rival theirs, and the sweet and docile, meek, humble, and kind will have no choice but to change their minds. We have um, so many instances of these injustices that we are having a hard time counting, right? Uh, and the more that it happens, the more this wave of our movement uh, increases and gets larger. Uh, I'm working on a series of poems right now called Numbers for Days. These next two poems are in that same format. Uh, this poem is for Elijah McLean, and it's a, a numbered poem um, in parts, uh, a part of a series I'm working on. This is for Elijah McLean. One, the violin is not a simple instrument. It is maple and spruce and more. 70 pieces, a body, a soul, a neck. Two, Elijah was not a simple man. He was black and kind and more. Many pieces, a body, a soul, a neck. Three, carotid holds compress the arteries in the neck resulting in unconsciousness. Four, Research shows violinists have faster cognitive processing speeds than the average person. Maybe this is why, in that moment, Elijah tried reason, why he tried humanity, why he tried compassion, why he tried love, why he tried apologizing. Five, maybe Elijah was trying to string his words into a bow. Maybe he thought he could slide that bow across the F-holes of the pig's ears. Maybe he believed their hearts were capable of resounding music. Maybe he thought for a second that the cops would do their job and police the crime of their gross imaginations. Uh, this next one is, uh, I wrote the day that I, I read the story and saw the video of Amy Cooper um, uh, attacking Christian Cooper, uh, who is a bird watcher, a black bird watcher in New York. Uh, this woman had a dog off leash, you know, Christian confronted her about that. They were in, a, in an area that's protected. And we watched her weaponize whiteness. We watched her um, use the comfort and systemic privilege that white people are afforded, uh, especially when it comes to our, our systems of, of, of police. Um, I'm a little bummed out. He, he hasn't been cooperating with the investigation. Uh, he's saying that, you know, she suffered enough. Um, but uh, there's also this conversation about Karens, right? And uh, this poem is, uh, is, is about Amy, it's about Karens, it's about white supremacy and the weaponization of those things. It's also a numbered poem. One, Karen has a gun, 
The gun was given to her as a gift. Karen accepted the gift with a smile, the same smile her parents and grandparents wore. After all, the gun is an heirloom. Karen takes pride in what she's inherited too. Two weeks after I bought my first home, Karen, walking a beagle or some shit, interrupted me as I was looking for something in my car. My car was parked in my driveway, the driveway in front of my home. Drawing her gun, she asked, excuse me, what are you doing in that car? I see you. I'll call the police, they'll be here faster than you can run, three. Karen knows how to shoot. She doesn't fear the recoil. Karen doesn't always use the gun, but she's been trained how. Karen knows what a target looks like and how to reload a magazine. Round one, can you please stop? I'm a white woman. Round two, sir, I'm asking you to stop. I'm a white woman. Three, I'm taking pictures and I'm calling the cops. I'm a white woman. Round four, I'm gonna tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. I'm a white woman. Round five, he is threatening me and my dog. I'm a white woman. Round six, please send the cops immediately. I'm a white woman. Four, Karen was studious. She learned her colors early. Karen knows what white means and black and brown. Karen knows what red looks like bubbling out of the holes of a body lying on the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, as a poet, especially as poet laureate, I have, I have poems about everything, right? Um, but in these times, I feel like it's important to focus on, on issues that we're living through. Uh, one thing that we are still reckoning with is the idea of stolen land and who belongs here and who doesn't. And for our migrant and immigrant brothers and sisters and family that are, are migrating back and forth uh, across lands that they've always been indigenous to, um, we've seen how our, our, our country and, and those who would not rather see that react. Um, my family's been in the Southwest and on this side of, uh, you know, uh, the, the border for, for a long, long time before borders. Um, I'm excited because I get to go to um, the San Luis Valley this weekend. And uh, this poem and the next few kind of talk about those things. This is called Right Here. I have ancestors buried in the San Luis Valley at Los Cerritos Cemetery where the Rio and the Red Winged Blackbird and the crushing rock beneath the tires of our pickup truck is the only sound where the tall swaying grass hums as its golden body moves in unison like a choreographed number beneath the vast and unending sky. I wipe away the dust that is gathered atop the black and white photo on my great-great-grandfather's tombstone, something my dad swore he was going to chip out one day but never has. Bored kids use them as target practice, he would say, but maybe it was only him who did that as he pranced through the eternity of the Llano as a child. Manasa. The pueblito where my grandparents worked and fell in love still has no stoplights and life moves slowly as the chile simmers on the stove. My great uncle tells me stories of adobe and the acequias that once carried water like a sacrament to the land. Tells me his father herded sheep for the people who looked like us but had money. Tells me that we come from people with names like Cipriano, Liberato, Cleotilde, Maclovio, and Teodoro. He talks of the Spanish, the gross way the textbooks do, Ignoring the tamales steaming in the kitchen and the braids his mother wore like survival down her back. He tells me that we come from people whose hands were not afraid of the earth. People who relied on prayer. How my grandfather, a penetente, would bind cacti to his back, whip himself with the disciplina, asking his God for pity. How does this not make sense when the mountains in the distance are named for the blood of Christ? I have watched the river in Los Brazos perform miracles Christ-like feeding more men from its belly than one can imagine there on the bank where we know much about bread and fish. The tecolote in the tree stares down at us like an elder who was seen yesterday and knows about tomorrow. It's calm and poise, a testament to the lessons of the land. This land of conflict and culture, where people old as the sun once roamed freely before swords and armor and land grants, where the wind had a voice and the ears listened. Mexico, Nuevo Mexico and El Valle de San Luis are the same body. The migration back and forth before imaginary lines is ancient. So when they ask us where we are from, with that tone, with that loaded conversation that we know all too well, we simply point to the soil and say right here. This next poem is for those uh, who fear immigrants and refugees. Start by climbing your family tree. Traverse the beautiful branches, passing your parents and familiar relatives until you arrive at your ancestors. 
Take a moment to recognize your eyes and theirs. Smile, embrace them, talk to them. Do not be alarmed, they speak a language different from yours. Teach your tongue, the linguistic amnesiac, their idiom, it used to be yours too. Share a traditional meal with them. Maybe one lost to assimilation in the melting pot. When they pass the bread, take notice of the calluses on their hands, the way their tattered clothing seems to drape from their bones. As your foremother clears the table and your forefather moves to sit in his favorite chair, ask them how it felt crossing an ocean to reach the land of opportunity. Now descend from your family tree. In your best broken Spanish, ask the same questions to the earth-colored man who cooks at your favorite restaurant. Ask the woman who cleans toilets in your office building. Ask the child crying in a cage. Ask them how it felt being forced to leave home to reach the land of opportunity. Their stories will sound exactly like the ones that are running through your veins. About a year ago now-ish, maybe, maybe just over a year, there was a, a photo that circulated the, the internet, sort of went viral, of uh, a migrant and his daughter who had drowned um, in the Rio attempting to, to make their way here to the United States. The, um, the photo was, was well circulated and every now and then a visceral image like that reminds us of what's happening every single day at the, at the border. Um, and so when I saw that photo, you know, of course, like everyone else, it really impacted me. And I wrote this uh, for them and I like to call their name into spaces as much as I can because their names and their, their, their story and their, their souls are um, you know, metaphors for all of the people that have gone through that journey. And uh, so this is for Oscar Alberto and Angie Valeria Martinez. I imagine her two-year-old heart was small, maybe the size of an unripe fruit, something green, something growing toward promise, something not quite ready to be consumed. I imagine his heart was big, maybe the size of better tomorrows, something peaceful, something imaginary, something that could not wait. I cannot tell you why the river was hungry, why desperation continues to find itself stuck between the river's teeth, but dreams are boats that will not sink with bodies, humanity a buoy that floats where breath succumbs. There along the water's bank, belly down among the reeds, brown bodies expired like yesterday, like tomorrow, I am convinced this country likes it that way. There, it is easier to wash the blood dripping undeniably from its hands. Yes, um, thank you all for listening. I know I can't see you all, you know, but I'm sure there's, there's uh, I hope there's engagement, there's snaps, there's claps. Feel free to engage that way. Um, if this were a live show, you know, we'd be feeding off each other's energy. So uh, thank you so much for listening. We are. Uh, you know, of course, in the middle of a pandemic, and as, as a poet, I've been processing that quite a bit. Um, the next couple poems I've written, you know, throughout the time that I've been uh, at home, this first poem is simply called COVID-19. The sirens are sounding. The screams are loud. The virus has packed its bags. World traveler without a passport. Borders are man-made. Walls cannot contain life on the move, but that's another story. Asian businesses were empty before streets. Racism, the toilet paper is gone. Panic begets panic. My 3 p.m. meeting is now a Zoom conference. Tom Hanks is raising his hand. Let's talk about the poor. 30 million uninsured, ends meet public transportation to get there. Self-quarantine, privilege, paradox. Blue collars can't work remotely hourly wages, side-eye the salaried, go ahead and cancel school, child care is a killer too, industrialized without a heart, developed without a conscience, capitalism gaslights, blames our bodies instead of broken systems, wash your hands, cough into your sleeve, plutocracy lampooning universal health care, call on your god or whatever, just don't touch your face when you make the sign of the cross. This next poem I wrote when we started to really have the conversation about who is an essential worker, right? And we watched as the service industry, as um, you know, people uh, with those jobs were the ones who were most affected in communities who were uh, you know, statistically more likely to suffer the effects of this virus. Uh, so I wrote this for the workers. And together we watched it happen. Watched the stars come out at night. There, right before our eyes, a grand reveal. 
And the stars, the people, they did what they always do. They got up, they packed their lunch, they clocked in, they delivered their bodies, they took orders, they worked. They didn't complain, they were grateful, they smiled, they cashed their checks, they paid their bills, they were broke again, they prayed, they stretched, they made miracles, they raised children, they dreamed in grocery stores and fields and janitor's closets and restaurants and shelters and classrooms and factories and banks and offices and warehouses, buses, trucks, trains, some in emergency rooms and clinics and morgues and mortuary they worked because rent, because food, because bills, because insurance, because integrity, because heart, because someone has to make the money for those at the top who don't really make it themselves. Uh, yes, I am going to end with this poem. This poem is sort of a, a take on a metaphor that may be, um, you know, transitioning into cliche at this point. But as we gather for the next three days and we're having these conversations, um, one of the metaphors that always sort of seems to um, be employed when we're doing this work is, is coming to the table, right? Who is at the table? Who's making decisions? Who is not at the table? Why are they not at the table? Do we want to be at the table? Do we need to build a new table? And these are all questions I think that we should ask um, for the rest of the, the time that we share together. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This is my last poem. Come, all of you, and gather around the table. Bring with you the heavy luggage society has unfairly packed for you, the bags overflowing with barriers you have somehow ingeniously figured out how to navigate. Or if your bags are a bit less heavy or are filled to the brim with privilege passed down like an heirloom, bring them too. Do not fret if you feel your cup is empty or if your china is encrusted with gold, for today we'll treat this table as an equalizer. Today, honest conversation and selfless action will be the food that nourishes us. Before we sit, let us pass our stories around like bread. Take a piece for yourself, but always be conscientious. Ensure there is enough to go around, for some know there is not always enough to go around. Or maybe there's always been enough. Maybe in the back, in the rooms where the food is prepared, there is a surplus of things tucked away from the grasp and eyes of the peering stockpiles of things, cannily sharing a wall with moaning scarcity. Maybe the meal was designed this way, where some are intentionally invited to the helping and others intentionally left off the guest list, no seat pulled out or given up, no place setting bearing their name. And if you're not invited to the table, as they say, it is possible that you are on the menu and those without seats, those of us tired of being consumed have this collection of your ugly we have been saving. Saving for moments just like these. Boxes filled with old bones and new blood. Attics packed with epithets and mason jars full of scars. Cedar chests stacked with broken treaties and the nooses tied around our forefathers' necks. We keep under our beds the sting of your water hoses and the no dogs, Negroes, or Mexican signs you once flew proudly like flags. Buried in locked boxes beneath our fruit trees is the barbed wire of your internment camps, the bars of the prisons you built salivating with us in mind. We have, next to the extra virgin Mary candles in our closets, the gods ripped from our grandmothers, the languages you choked out of our throats. We have albums thick with snapshots of history our DNA refuses to forget. We store in file cabinets next to broken olive branches the names of family and friends deported, the names of family and friends banned, and you wonder why we grimace when we taste your apple pie, why the sweetness you savor is too bitter for us to swallow. You wonder why we kneel when your flag is raised, why our bald fists still have to punch holes in your pretty blue sky, because we know that what the machine hasn't already swallowed, it will most definitely be coming for. Tractors with growling bellies and flesh between their teeth. This disease that runs rabbit through them. This unquenchable thirst for things that are not theirs. Your tables are not new to us. These tables you made us fashion but refused us to sit at. Our hands and feet and hearts know them well. This perk of being the builder. This perk of baptizing the wood with your sweat. In your rear view mirror, you can see us coming for you. But we're not coming for your head necessarily. We're aiming for the humanity that lives somewhere in the basement of your heart. Our very existence is ceremony. This struggle sewn into our being. This survival radiating from our resilience. This joy we make space for despite the sting. Do not be surprised if we ask why the invitation was late. 
If we show you we built a table of our own, one we fashioned out of necessity when we realized yours wasn't large enough to hold us, do not be surprised if we hand you a wrecking ball before we do our voice, if we ask you to dismantle the comfortable place you sit at as we watch, and when you are finished, pass the wrecking ball to us, we too will break down the silos we have built then, when we are both left standing in the rubble of what used to be, let us weigh our pieces until the scale is balanced, for it is not enough to merely have a seat at the table, one must be the designer of it, so let us destroy to rebuild anew, let us unpack our bags, lend each other our ears, and gift each other our hearts for listening and loving our foundations to understanding and conflict does not have to be combat conflict can be a supple garden that change grows in so let's grow things together let's sit at a new inclusive table pass our stories around like bread eat be fed be healthy be valued and truly be heard thank you so much Thank you, Bobby. Um, let me see. Um, thank you, 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 thank you. I am always so moved by your words. Um, I saw comments about crying. I was crying off screen. Um, so I just want to take a moment to honor that. I want us to feel what Bobby has just offered us and what we have received. Um, think about, as Franklin spoke to at the beginning of our day, how that feels in our body, where that is landing, um, and embrace that, because that's what it means to bring our full selves into this work, right? We have arrived in our bodies right now, so welcome. Welcome to this. Um, and really just feel that, breathe that. Emotions are powerful things, and if we don't, if we don't um, give space for them, they can become weapons that work against us. So. Take a few minutes to breathe. Um, we can take a collective breath together, a few of them, and then we'll move into the closing out of this welcome. And I'll give you some more time between the next session where we will talk about preparing and planning for equity work. Okay, so a few breaths. And as you're inhaling, just think about how you feel. And what that feeling is telling you. And think about how you will listen to it. Think about how you will use it to help you move through these conversations today. Or maybe it's telling you that you might not be ready for them. And that's okay too. We are recording these sessions, so you can always come back to it at a different point. But it's important to recognize how you are feeling and whether or not you feel prepared to show up in the ways in which you need to. And if they are propelling you forward, then hold on to those feelings and help them, use them to help them anchor you. So we'll take one more breath, inhale. And then exhale, heavy. And as you are moving through the rest of your day and you feel emotional, if you feel sad, if you feel angered, if you feel all of those things, use your breath to come back to, to being in your body because I think that is where we all are right now. Um, so thank you, Bobby, for helping us land here. Um, and so I will end um, this part with another quote from Surprise Heavy by Kiese Lehman. Um, who, again, a brilliant book, definitely go buy it because it is, I don't know, it just is something that I think about literally constantly, which is why I've shared three quotes now um, here with you all. Um, so this quote says, I will ask you to give us a chance at a more meaningful process of healing. If we fall, give us a chance to fall honestly, compassionately together. The nation as it is currently constituted has never dealt with a yesterday or tomorrow where we were radically honest, generous, and, tenderest, and tender with each other. So take a moment to think, why are you here? I mean that deeply. What had to have occurred for you to be here today? What is your connection to what we are talking about at the symposium this week? What are we cultivating here? What are we choosing in this moment that we will continue to pursue? What work do we need to do in order to be able to do that? 
What are we constructing as we deconstruct? What are we building and how are we doing that together? Not in silos, but with each other. And how do we support one another's efforts? What is our commitment to ourselves and to our communities, to this work, to this land we occupy, and to our messy histories? And how do we hold ourselves accountable to those commitments? How do we keep that at the forefront of all that we do? I am here because I am committed to the fight for racial equity and healing. But more deeper than that, I am committed to restoring connection, to being fully in my body at all times, and to be modeling what that means. I'd like to invite you all to take a collective breath with me now. And again, exhale heavy. My intention for today is to create space for this radical equity, this racial equity that we have been talking about for it to breathe and come to life. Please grant us as organizers grace Please grant yourselves grace and please grant one another grace. And please, please, please make sure that what is learned here leaves. I'm grateful for you all for sharing space with us this week and for opening your ears, minds and hearts to what we have to say. I value your time, your energy and I deeply thank you for sharing it with me. Um, and now we will put back a screen where you can find contact information, including how to contact Bobby um, and to find out more about him and his poetry and his books, um, as well as Zakia and how you can get a hold of her. And I did want to address a few things in the comments. So with the closed captioning options, we in the future for future workshops are definitely going to preemptively hire folks who can do live captioning. Um, that was a misunderstanding on my part where I didn't realize um, what was required of that. Um, and I, I saw a comment about some potential solutions and so we will look into that. And if that's something that we can immediate, immediately implement, we will make sure to do that. Um, and the comment about the Karen, um, I think that's an interesting conversation. We definitely have the virtual networking space where you can engage in conversations with other folks. And so if anyone is interested in talking about that and wanting to have a dialogue about that, I invite you all to maybe schedule a time to meet up in the virtual networking space. Um, I think during the lunch hour, it will be open. Um, and so you can use that space to engage in conversation around that. Um, and then lastly, the comment about the sizeism um, and the, the reference to our code of conduct. Again, I am not here to police anyone's behavior, but I will say that it does require a certain amount of grace to be able to, um, to not take things um, as personally as we tend to take things. Um, and I just ask that when we are responding to comments, we try to we try to do so in a way that is still not necessarily encouraging, but create space for learning to continue happening um, because expressing learning um, and being shut down for, for coming upon that can be harmful and that's not what we want to have in this space. Um, again, thank you all for joining us in this welcoming session. We are looking forward to those of you who will trickle into our next session where we'll be speaking with four, four or five, I can't remember, um, but a bunch of brilliant people who will be talking about um, their organizations and where they are in their EDI journey. So thank you and take care.